Uh, today we celebrate uh, a Reformation. A uh, movement began 499 years ago when Martin Luther said, we need to talk, right? It was a reform movement, not intended to create a new church, simply to reform the one that we had, but he was a little bit ahead of his time. And so it, uh, it didn't really work out that way. It became a movement that we call then the Reformation, a major shift. Was a, was a major shift for the church, but it wasn't the first time the church had to go through a radical kinds of shift, and it won't be the last time. A little, just a little quick little history here. When the church began, it was an underground movement. It's illegal to be a Christian. It was sort of under the radar. Uh, and for about 380 years, that's how the church existed. But then something happened. Uh, in the year 380, Constantine becomes uh, emperor, and he says Christianity is out of the shadows, is now the official religion of the Roman Empire. Um, and that wasn't necessarily all a good thing, because all of a sudden now the church got wrapped up in the in midst of politics and power and wealth, um, and there were all kinds of abuses um, started to happen as well. Uh, in the year 1054, there was a split in the church, Split in half, east and west. Uh, there was some, some theological differences, but mostly it was cultural and language and race that really split the church apart between the east and the west. We, and so we, we have what we call the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. Well, things go on for another about 500 years until 1517, and again, uh, the Roman Catholic Church that experiences another split. This is when Luther and others who were working with him show up, uh, and they said, you know, our authority for how we live our lives does not rest in church hierarchy, but our authority rests with the Scripture. And let's put the Scripture, instead of in, in the hands of the scholars, let's put the Scriptures in the hands of everyday people. When everyone can read the scriptures themselves, then they can say, how is God leading us? And what happens then is this explosion of, of, the, of the Spirit in lots of different ways in which people find ways to express uh, the faith. And one of those, and we call them, in generally we call them Protestants, protesting the way it had been before into a, sort of a new way of doing that. Well, Martin Luther was, was the right person at the right time to help fuel this moment. Uh, and so one of the things that happened because, like I mentioned, Luther translated the scriptures into the language that ordinary people could understand. And that's opened up the floodgates for this movement uh, to go. Uh, the other thing that Luther did was to uh, write singable music. Luther was a musician. He loved, loved making music. And what he would oftentimes do would be borrowing tunes from pop culture, uh, tunes people already knew and liked to sing, and simply put new words with them. Uh, and with that spirit, uh, this is a, little, a song dedicated to Martin Luther. All right. Hold. All right, thanks. We have been uh, racing our way through the uh, Old Testament, tracing the thread, the story of God's great love, how God is, is working to reconcile, to redeem a broken creation. So it's been a story about relationships between God and the people of God. So we've had stories of Abraham and Moses and David, people who are flawed but, but in the midst of that uh, faithful. We find God coming and committing to bless the whole world uh, through these people. And we're going to be spending some time the next couple of weeks looking at some of the kings and some of the prophets who were sent to speak to them. So last week we were hearing about David. Remember, David, uh, God came to David, promises, I'm going to be with you and your family. Uh, and when your son is king, I will be like a father to him, and I will discipline him if it becomes, ne not if, when it becomes necessary, I will discipline him. And was it ever necessary? All right, the son who takes the throne is named Solomon. Uh, and we think of Solomon for his great wisdom. And for all his wisdom, he just was not very smart. Um, he ignored God's command. Um, 700 of his 1,000 wives, that's right, he had 1,000 wives, 700 of them were foreign princesses. Instead of going to battle, what he would do is simply, you know, find out who it was, who his enemies were, and simply marry the daughter of the king uh, and bring her into the household. And so um, 700 foreign uh, princesses, and they brought their own gods and things, the situation, and uh, in the midst of all that, there was compromise that was made, and that spelled trouble. Uh, so Solomon went down a path that was not good. And when Solomon dies, then there's not a peaceful transfer of power, right? 
Uh, there's conflict over secession to the throne, and it splits the country in two. Uh, the nor uh, ten northern tribes secede. Civil war breaks out. Now, this has been going on, by, for our reading today, it's been going on for about 60 years. All right, the northern tribes now go by the name of Israel. Southern tribes you have chosen the name Judah. Now, in the north, we see a series of, of dreadful kings. Now, since the temple was in the south, right, so you can see where the line, the line between uh, Jerusalem is down here. It's in the south, and that's the only place where the temple can be. There's no other place they, uh, they could have the temple. So they had to build their own temple up, up in the north, all right? So up here in uh, Samaria then becomes sort of the capital uh, for the northern. And so they create a temple there, but this is temple has golden calves, all right? Because many of the... Uh, of the um, the, kings, uh, the kings there worshipped the, the Baal. Uh, so the, we had the, the, the golden calf was one of the images for the, for the god Baal. The worst of these kings is a guy named um, Ahab. And he may, ends up marrying a, a, a priestess of Baal named Jezebel. And so they set up the worship of Baal as the official religion of Israel, is worshipping uh, Baal. Now God is not happy. So he raises up a reformer, someone who we need to make a change here. We we're going down the wrong path. He raises up a guy named Elijah. Uh, now, when we talk about miracles in the Bible, um, there's different names maybe come to you as you think about who are those in the Bible who did miracles. Certainly there's people like Moses, right? The, the, the 10 plagues in Egypt to let, uh, let Pharaoh let people go. Or people like Jesus who, who could, uh, could uh, heal the sick or, or miraculously feed people or raise people from the dead. And then there's Elijah who did all the above. Anything Moses or Jesus did, Elijah could do better, right? He, he's the one of the guys, uh, when it comes to miracles, uh, doesn't, get better than, doesn't get better than Elijah. Um, so Elijah appears to Ahab and says, God has brought judgment on you and it's not going to rain. I'm just going to shut up the heavens. No rain for you. So let's, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 17. Um, Elijah was a prophet from Tishbe and Gilead. One day he went to King Ahab and said, I'm a servant of the living God, the God of Israel, and I swear in his name that it won't rain until I say so. There won't even be any dew on the ground. I didn't go very well with King Ahab, right? So the Lord says to Elijah, you better leave. <laughs> Cross the Jordan River and hide near Chariath Creek. You can drink water from the creek and eat the food I've told ravens to bring you. And Elijah obeyed the Lord and went to live by Chariath Creek. The ravens brought him bread and meat twice a day and he drank water from the creek. But after a while, it dried up because there was no rain, right? So now what? God had provided for Elijah, but things dried up. He's a wanted man because of pronouncing this drought. Uh, and so God says, all right, it's not enough just to hide in the wilderness. You better leave the country. So he goes to Zarephath in Sidon, hometown of Queen Jezebel. All right, really? <laughs> God, you want, I'm, Jezebel's trying to kill me, put a price in my head, and so you want me to go to her hometown. Um, but he does. He obeys God and he goes. Uh, maybe, maybe the pagans up there were doing better, accumulating more stuff that the drought was gonna, not going to affect them as much. But no, God says, I want you to go and stay with a widow there, the poorest, most vulnerable pagan in a foreign land. And this, is, this is God's plan, all right? So the Lord said to Elijah, go to the town of Zarephath in Sidon and live there. I've told a woman in that town to give you food. When Elijah came near the town gate of Zarephath, he saw a widow gathering sticks for a fire. Would you bring me a cup of water, he asked. She left to get it. Then he asked, would you also bring me a piece of bread? The widow answered, in the name of the living God, Lord your God, I swear I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour and a little olive oil, and I'm on my way home now with these few sticks to cook what I have for my son and myself, and then we will starve to death. Elijah said, everything will be fine. Go do what you said. Go home, fix something for you and your son, but first, make a small piece of bread and bring it to me. The Lord God of Israel has promised, your jar of flour will not run out. 
your bottle of oil will not dry up before he sends rains for the crops. The widow went home. She did exactly what Elijah told her. She and Elijah and her family had enough food for a long time, and the Lord kept his promise uh, that the prophet Elijah had made. She did not run out of flour or oil. And they lived happily ever after. No, that's not what it says. What it says is, several days later, the son of the woman who owned the house got sick, and he kept getting worse until he died. The woman shouted at Elijah, What have I done to you? I thought you were God's prophet. Did you come here to cause death of my son as a reminder that I've sinned against God? Elijah said, Bring me your son. He took the boy from her arms and carried him upstairs to the room where he was staying. Elijah laid the boy on his bed and he prayed, Lord God, why did you do such a terrible thing to this woman? She's letting me stay here and now you've let her son die. Elijah stretched himself out over the boy three times while praying, Lord God, bring this boy back to life. And the Lord answered Elijah's prayer. The boy started breathing again. And Elijah picked him up and carried him downstairs and gave the boy to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. You are God's prophet, the woman replied. Now I know you really speak for God. Well, there's lots more of Elijah's stories. So 1 Kings chapter 17 just gets you started, and then you can read on lots of wonderful stories about Elijah. But what do we, what do we get from this story here? Um, again, we see the power of a promise. That's what we've been talking about all the way through, these promises and how these promises get lived out. Elijah makes this seemingly impossible demand on this widow to give the last of your resources to me, offers her nothing in return except a promise that God will provide. The miracle, I think the real miracle here is that she believes him, right? Uh, and it happens when we realize that we, we can't do it all. We're not in control of everything. And God blesses her not because she's so religious, but because she was willing to trust in this promise. Now just because my, God makes a promise he's going to be with us doesn't mean everything's going to be easy in our lives, right? Her son falls ill. He dies. She becomes angry, thinks it's about punishment. Elijah gets upset as well because he doesn't accuse God of taking the life, but he says, you let it happen. That's just as bad. How could you do that? Both of them assume because something happens, God wanted it to be that way. But if we, if we look at this big story, there's all kinds of things that we're going to come as we come across the Bible of things that, that happen that are not what God wanted to happen. Right? We live in this, this world where we have this free will kind of stuff and there's brokenness all around us. Not everything that happens happens because God wants it to, uh, but God is there in the midst of it promising to be with us. The promise is not that bad things won't happen because they, we know that's how the world goes. There are bad things that happen to good people. But God's promise is, I will be with you in the midst of that. Through the darkest valley of shadow of death, I will be with you. Nothing can separate you from my love, not even death. And he raises the widow's son as a reminder of that. Now, in the coming weeks, we're going to be meeting other prophets who speak for God, who oftentimes speak boldly to power to bring us, to bring them back to God, all part of God's plan to redeem and reconcile his broken creation. And this is a pattern that we see continuing uh, uh, as we celebrate it today. A prophet named Martin Luther, uh, God raised up to, to speak a word of, to power, to challenge its institutional church, that forgiveness was not something to be bought and sold, but it's something that was a free gift from God. God doesn't give up on us, right? Reformation was not a one-time deal. It's a way of life. We think of what is God, what new ways is God moving us and bringing us uh, into, into a, a relationship here. If there's anyone who should get that, it's us Lutherans uh, who trace our story back to Martin Luther. But it's so easy to forget. We think that things are, uh, that we're sort of in control of things and forget to open ourselves. It's not easy, this battle that goes on between us. And so when Luther uh, used language of what this Reformation was about, he says, this is not, we're not doing this because it's easy. Not even because I want to do this, but this is the word of God. It's compelling me. We need to speak a word of truth in the midst of this. 
Uh, he says it's like a, uh, it's a, this battle going on. And so um, we'll get the band back up here in a second. We're going to sing a song where Luther uh, sort of becomes sort of this rallying cry of the Reformation um, about God fighting for us. It's not about st- you know, people stepping up their game and trying harder. It's saying we have a champion who fights for us in this battle. Uh, there will be difficulties. This not, will not be an easy thing, but we have the promise in the midst of this that we are not alone. Let's rise for this.